Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Check, check. Good morning, Etiha. How's it going? Going well. I see you're all noisy, so it means you're filled with energies. Hello? Okay, so we will start with some uh, side communications today. Uh, first, uh, we have office hours published on the site. Please check them out uh, and feel free to attend them. We have uploaded on the site uh, a, a Google form for signing up for the hardware exercises. So this will be uh, the first round of, of, of interrogations. How do you ask it? How do you say it? Uh, you, we want to get an idea of how many people are actually interested in doing it, and then once we understand the number of people, we will do our magic math, figure out what's the optimal group size, and then we'll ask you guys to uh, tell us which groups do you want to actually have. So, who do you want to be working with? Please, when you, uh, if you consider signing up for the hardware exercises, uh, make sure that if you sign up, you, you will make them, okay? You will do them. Um, we have limited hardware, so too many people take away the opportunity from others to, to go through the experience, so please commit yourself if you decide to sign up. Third, I would like to uh, stress and uh, the, the importance of the feedback. Uh, we really appreciate the feedback you guys give for both the lectures and the exercises especially uh, the bad one, but even the good one. They're very useful. Please continue sending it in. I would like to thank in particular the student, I don't know who, who took the time to write a long uh, uh, explanation of their, of their feedback. That was really helpful, so please, please keep it up. As you have noticed, there were some typos in the slides of last week. Um, it's normal. There, were, there are going to be typos in all the slides. We continuously revise them, though, so uh, anytime you want to start studying the, <coughs> restudying something, just make sure you go on the site and download the latest version. There might be some slight modifications. And uh, so, yeah, these are the four technical site communications. And the last thing I would like to do is, uh, in lieu of the upcoming hardware exercises, you might remember that the DuckyBot platform that we will be, the DuckyTown platform and the DuckyBots in particular that you will be working with have a software architecture based on Linux and uh, Python. Um, we understand that uh, it is not a prerequisite for you to know neither uh, Linux and Python, but I would like to point out this great opportunity of uh, student-run um, Linux workshops, and it might be a good idea for you to attend one of these. I would like to invite Ar Arthur to explain you a little bit more about this. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. The to, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, hi, I'm from the Alternative. Uh, we are the Linux community here at ETH, and every semester we do um, this so called Linux days, and there are a couple of workshops. Um, where you will learn uh, a lot about free and open source software, and uh, we will um, make the best. We will uh, make the best effort to teach you a lot about uh, open source software, uh, so you know the ethics behind it. And um, yeah, and when you decide to install Linux on your machine, um, you will be not alone. We will help you at the install events. There will be two of them, so um, you can decide which one you want to attend. And um, yeah, we have like two introduction uh, workshops, one to free software and one especially um, focused on Linux. Then we have the install events and um, then we have follow-up workshops. So when you have installed Linux, you, you will be not a, um, be alone and we will help you understand how it works. And we have the Linux toolkit course um, where you learn special features of uh, the Linux machine. And then we have the hacking session. Hack, hacking session. Um, this is especially a practice uh, course where you can, um, where you will be 
uh, solving exercises, and there will be also a lot of helpers to help you with the exercises. And then you have Power of Linux. This is a, um, a course where you will learn especially useful um, uh, exercises, uh, no, especially useful features of Linux. And then we have the bash scripting workshop, if you're interested in learning how to, uh, yeah, bash script. <laughs> And then we have the Spotlight course, and uh, this is a, this is a um, workshop that has a special spotlight um, every semester, so changes every semester. So yeah, if you're interested in that, um, visit our website, sign up if you want to, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. Linux looks very baffling if you never used it before, so really take the opportunity to have somebody that guides you through the first steps, because once you get a hand of it, it's, a, it's relatively straightforward. So, we can start the class now. Uh, today we will uh, do two things. That First, we will wrap up the lesson of last time. Uh, we didn't have the uh, time to go through a few important things nominally finding the stability of uh, discrete time systems and uh, looking at an example of how to actually implement the things we have talked about. And uh, then we will start talking about MIMO systems, which, is, which are going to be a big part of the course. MIMO systems are multi-input, multi-output systems, and uh, we will, through the next few lessons, go through uh, the same process that you have seen for single input, single output systems. So we will first do an analysis uh, of the structural properties of the system. Then we will look at different uh, um, major differences with single input, single output systems. And eventually we'll end up uh, um, analyzing ways to synthesize controllers for, for multi-input, multi-output systems. So up to now, as a brief recap of what is the bigger picture, we have uh, recalled what are the objectives of a controller. Uh, that's the whole purpose for which we are studying control systems. Nominally, these are the concepts of stability, of performance, and robustness. We then looked at the gang of six, or the gang of four, which were a number of uh, transfer functions relating different inputs and outputs of the system. And we saw that those were a powerful tool to quantify performances of the system. And uh, once we had uh, understood the objectives and the tools to achieve these objectives, we looked at what were the limitations that we encounter in designing a controller. And we distinguished between some fundamental limitations that are related, let's say, to the theory, to the actual physics, that there's nothing we can do about if not to deal with, and uh, some practical limitations that come from, for example, the actual implementation of a control system in a discrete environment. Today, we will, uh, but all of this, we, we, we saw for single input, single output systems, and that was the topic of control systems one. Today, we will uh, finish talking about discrete time systems, and particularly, we will see how, what does it mean for a discrete time system uh, to be a linear time invariant uh, single input, single output, discrete time system, be stable. And uh, we will talk about MIMO systems. So, in, previous, in the previous class, we understood that uh, in order to actually transform a design of a controller into a working piece of hardware, most often we use, we use these um, computers, microcontrollers, to um, do the operation of reading the inputs and producing the outputs. And uh, we saw that there were a number of uh, fundamental steps going on um, in transforming, the, uh, let's say, at the boundaries between the continuous time and the discrete time domain. In the transformation between uh, continuous time and discrete time, we saw that it was uh, governed by an analog to digital conversion block, which included uh, the fundamental uh, set step of sampling, that is to evaluate a signal at specific time instants that are spread apart in a constant time called the sampling period. And then uh, these signals get quantized, get transformed in a 
sequence of zeros and ones, they go into the processor, the processor does the something, and uh, it sends these, uh, the something to compute what the uh, input to the actuators of the system would be. This uh, discrete time input gets then uh, converted to a continuous time signal again to a digital to analog conversion. We saw the zero order hold or the sample and hold process. And uh, this signal now becomes continuous again and can interact with the, with the real world. We understood that while we were sampling a signal, we were clearly throwing away data in the sense that by definition, sampling means just evaluating a function at specific points. So anywhere else, things don't exist. And we asked ourselves the question, okay, but up to what degree can we uh, throw away data without losing information? That is, what is the minimal number of samples that we need in order to be able to reconstruct the original time continuous signal without any ambiguity? And we saw that there was this fundamental result called the, the sampling theorem that told us that uh, we need to sample uh, fast enough, where fast enough is defined uh, through the uh, bandwidth of the signal that we are sampling. So the, the bigger the bandwidth of a signal, that is, the greater its, 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 its variation, the, more, the faster we need to sample it in order not to lose information. And uh, we saw a quantitative relationship that said that the sampling rate, this is the inverse of the sampling period, has to be at least, has to be bigger than the Nyquist rate, which is twice the bandwidth of the system. And we saw that, we just said that uh, there is a, a rule of thumb that says that it's better in practical applications to use a sampling rate that is way higher than the Nyquist rate. And, uh, and this is because uh, in real life, uh, in practical applications, the signals are never really band limited, which is an assumption of the sampling theorem. They always have some small frequency content at high frequencies. So um, although we can use an anti-aliasing filter, which is basically a low-pass filter or, or a, a device meant to remove the high frequency content of the continuous time signal before sampling it, um, this, in, in practice, there is always a little bit of high frequency content, so sampling at a faster rate is useful. Once we understood how to choose our sampling rate, we saw that it was necessary to understand the, how dynamic, dynamical equations uh, converted to discrete time, from continuous to discrete time. So how did we pass from derivatives that are continuous operators to uh, finite differences, which are, uh, of course, approximations of derivatives. And we saw different ways to approximate these derivatives. And then we used this information to transform a uh, uh, state space representation, so x dot equals ax plus pu from a continuous to a discrete time and uh, version, and we analyzed how to convert the matrices. Finally, we looked at the process of emulation, that is, how do we actually deal with implementing a controller? Well, in discrete time, there are different ways, but we said, let's just design the controller for the continuous time version, and then we transform it into the discrete time version, and we implement that. So just a brief recap, we saw that uh, we could convert the continuous time system into the discrete one. It's worth uh, repeating that when in the discrete time version we use the notation x of k, that means actually the signal x in this case evaluated at the time tk, which is the time t0 plus k steps of the sampling period. So that's a shorthand notation. And it's worth reminding again that uh, xk plus 1 means the signal at the next step. Okay? So since there is no concept, no, no concept of continuity in, uh, in uh, discrete time, the next step is the closer we can get to the x dot that is provision on the future. So saying xk plus 1 means basically defining a differential equation in discrete time, a, different, a difference equation. I would like to stress that there was a typo on the slides last week. CD is equal just to C, not to C times AD. And we saw that um, we actually computed the explicit representation. So once you have the discrete time version of a linear time invariant system, how do you actually express the X and the Y? 
So one thing we did not talk about is the uh, stability of these systems. So, okay, say that we have a discrete time system like this. How do we figure out if it's uh, stable or not? You saw in uh, this in the continuous time version that uh, the fundamental condition for a stability of a system was related to the eigenvalues of the A matrix. And uh, you saw that for a system to be asymptotically stable, the condition was that all the real parts of the eigenvalues had to be negative, right? And uh, for a marginally stable system, they, had, they could have uh, an equal to zero part. So there's something similar going on in discrete time systems. Stability is always related to the value of the, uh, of the eigenvalues of the discrete A matrix. But things change a little bit. So I would like to actually go through the passages and show you uh, how we obtain this result. The final result is that stability is now uh, guaranteed, not if you have the, the real parts of the eigenvalues that are negative, but if the eigenvalues are in absolute value smaller than one. They're within a unit circle. Okay? It doesn't matter if they're positive or negative. So let's actually compute this. So, so what's the idea? The idea is that we have uh, discrete time system. So, can you read down there? And uh, for just for for simplicity, for brevity, I will drop the pedix d discrete from uh, from the matrices of the linear time invariant system. But what I mean now, since we are writing this in discrete time, it is intended that all the matrices are the discrete time versions, OK? So this is A times X of K plus B U of K. And we saw that, um, so what is the objective? We want to figure out some uh, condition on A such that the system is stable. What does it mean the system is stable? It means that uh, if I set some uh, initial conditions, the, system will, the, the states of the system will converge to zero if it's asymptotically stable or to some constant different from zero if it's marginally stable. But fundamentally, you might recall even in the continuous time case that but we can write it for the discrete time case, that the evolution of the signal x is equal to two parts. It's the sum of two components. One is uh, related to the initial conditions. Okay, So here we mean that x of 0 is x of 0. Okay? So x of 0 is the state at time 0. It's the initial condition. Plus, there was another term that took into account the effect of the input in time. So it was i that goes from 0 to k minus 1 of what? a of k minus 1 minus i b u of i. So this term here we call the free evolution in the same way as you did for continuous time system. And this is the forced evolution. So why is it forced? Because it's driven by the input, OK? So for stability purposes, yes, sir? Wait, can I take the, the cube of terror? <laughs> here, here. May I throw it to you? Sure. Sorry. OK, um, that x in the beginning, is that a capital X, or is that just a lowercase x? OK, because... so thank you for the question. Let's clear this once and for all. <laughs> so it's a small x, but it doesn't really matter, OK? so. I understand that the, there is, you, you, you are, I mean, you are uh, used to the notation that capital letters are used for frequency domain signals, exactly. while uh, small letters are used for time domain signals. These are notations, right? Notations is just something we agree on. So as long as we understand each other, we can pretty much even draw flowers and houses, potentially. Sure. So the idea is, if I specify the argument, then it should be clear what we're talking time about. Domain. In this case, we're talking about discrete time signals. I could sometimes uh, use, for example, big gas like this to say a maybe a Laplace, for a Laplace uh, transformation of a signal x of t. 
but uh, sometimes I might just write it as small x of s. Some other times you'll see it written as a tilde like this. Okay, so there are many notations that are used, and uh, to if the argument is explicitated, then it should be obvious. If uh, we do not put the arguments, hopefully it's obvious from the context. If it's not, ask, and we'll specify it again. So let me erase this thing I wrote. Easier if I just do like this. Is it exciting to the point that... Okay, so what are we saying here? That there's two components. Uh, we are interested in understanding if the system blows up when we uh, move it from an equilibrium point. So we don't really care about the part that is driven by the external input, and we can study only the free evolution. So what is our objective? Our objective now is finding a way to express this such that we gain some insight on the properties of uh, A that regulate this evolution. So let's suppose, this is an assumption, a hypothesis, that uh, um, A has real and distinct eigenvalues. Okay, why do we make this hypothesis? We make this hypothesis so that we can make our life easier. In particular, we will call these eigenvalues lambda i, and uh, we will call the associated eigenvectors ui. So remember that uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors are related to this equation. So once we have defined eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we can define a matrix. Let's call it T inverse. That is basically, so each one of these eigenvectors is a vector. And uh, if A has dimension n by n, which is the order of the system, U is an n by one vector. This obviously is a scalar, a one by one. So we can say this is U1. Then we put u2. Basically, we're stacking all these vectors like this up to the nth one. And this becomes an n by n invertible matrix because these are the eigenvectors and they're linearly independent. We can say that the T matrix, this is the inverse of this, which it exists. We'll just call it V1 and the same thing, V2 up to Vn. Now the V vectors are uh, one by N row vectors. So N T of course is an N by N as well. Once we define the T inverse and the T matrix, we know that we can use them to diagonalize the a matrix through a transformation. So if we say uh, T times A times T inverse, so you saw these concepts in control system one, we know that this is a diagonal matrix. And uh, we know that if the system has real and distinct eigenvalues, this is a diagonal matrix that has the eigenvalues on the diagonal and zero everywhere else we can write as a diagonal matrix like this. And remember that what we're looking for here is a way to basically express A of K, right? So we have to ask our question, uh, what happens if we um, now express, look for the, an expression of this um, quantity, why? So that we can eventually isolate A of K. This is equal to T 
TA T inverse times TA T inverse times the same thing TA T inverse K times. Why? Well, just we can by inspection see that if we multiply these quantities over and over, we always get a T inverse T, T inverse T, and so on. So these go away. And uh, what we get is T A times A times A times A K times up to T inverse. So this is actually equal to T A K T inverse. But each one of these terms is what? Is D. So this is equal to dk, which for a diagonal matrix is equal to always a diagonal matrix, but with the diagonal components raised at the kth power. Okay? So this is very nice because it allows us to now express ak, which is what we need to get to our final destination, through the eigenvalues of a. In particular, from here, we can pre-multiply by T inverse and post-multiply. Pre-multiply means multiply on the left. Post-multiply means multiply on the right. I'll actually do the passages. So we can multiply T inverse on the left here and T on the right, but we have to do it to both parts. So this becomes T inverse and T, and we get that we get that a to the k is equal to t inverse dt. Okay? Sorry, d to the k, t. So now we can plug this in here at the place of a k. And what do we get? We get that a x of k is equal to t inverse dk t times x naught. Now we can explode each one of these components. Remember the definitions. We get that T inverse is U1 up to UN. Now we have a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues at the kth power, and then we multiply by T, which is v1 down to vn times x0, okay? So this can be seen as, can be re-expressed as, so this is a diagonal matrix, right? So row time column, we get u1 lambda 1 k u1 down to lambda n u at the KUN. This is an n by n matrix. This is an n by one vector. We could uh, just leave them like this for now. Now we have, these are all zeros, row times column. This turns out to be the sum for i that goes from 1 to n of what? Of lambda i at the kth power. These are row times columns. So it's this times this plus this times this plus everything times the last one. So it's lambda i's, u i's times v i's, x zero. We can call this ci just to put them together and we get the expression we were looking for. So what does this expression tell us? This expression This expression 
tells us that the free evolution of a system is the sum of some quantities. These quantities, we call them the natural modes of the system. And uh, you can see that they are governed by the, their, their, their evolution and time depends by the eigenvalue of the A matrix. And it's a number at the power k. So if that number is smaller than one, if you increase the power k as time proceeds, the number will go down. If it's bigger than one, it will grow. So the conditions on stability are that the, lambda, the absolute values of the lambda a's have to be smaller than one for the natural mode to be convergent. So if all eigenvalues, all the natural modes are convergent, the system is as statically stable. They're constant instead if the lambda is equal to one, one at the power k is always one, so there is no uh, growing or, 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 or attenuation in time. And uh, the modes are divergent if lambda is bigger than one. And we sometimes we define them as to be aperiodic, that is without a period, if they are bigger than zero and alternating if they're smaller than zero. Why? Because if you have a negative value and you take power, then you've got an alternation, positive, negative, positive, negative, depending if the power is an odd or an even number. So the same holds if you want to uh, look at a system that instead doesn't just have distinct and real eigenvalues, but has complex conjugate distinct eigenvalues. The process for which you obtain this is exactly the same as I did now, but the math is slightly more, more, more complex. So we will not do it now at the blackboard. I will get back to it at the end of the class if we have time. So, but the concept is the same. The, there's going to be a component that is uh, sinusoidal, but uh, everything depends on that row i at the beginning that is fundamentally the uh, magnitude of the complex eigenvalues. So again, the condition is that the magnitude of the complex eigenvalue has to be smaller than one, and, the, and, the, and they're termed to be, and the natural modes in this case are called the pseudoperiodic, and they are constant, convergent, and divergent, depending again on if the row is bigger, smaller, or equal than one. So last time we saw even this emulation recipe which was a way to uh, actually get uh, a controller implemented on a computer. But we really just uh, spoke about it without looking at uh, how to do the last step, how to actually get something that we can write on a computer. So I would like to go through an example after just recapping that the process that we're going to follow is that of uh, supposing we have a continuous time plant, we design the controller in continuous time that satisfies all our performance requirements for that plant. Now we want to discretize that controller and implement it. And the way we discretize the controller is by using one of the approximations that we described last class. And um, I will just want to spend a brief note on, the, on, on Z transforms. We're not going to go in details of them. Uh, you have some notes that we uploaded that show the formally the relationship between the Laplace transform and the, the Z transform. But just to give you an idea of what's going on, so there is there is a, a big analogy with what you already know in uh, continuous time. So if we start from a signal f of t and we do the Laplace transform, we go to f of s, okay, which is the uh, frequency domain representation of that signal. And if we want to bounce back to the time domain, we just do the inverse Laplace transformation. And that's something you know perfectly already. Last class, we looked at how, in, so if you look at the left part, we're looking at time. The right part is frequency. Top part is continuous, bottom part is discrete, okay? So if we looked how to move between uh, uh, continuous and discrete time through analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion, and then the Z transform, we didn't formally introduce it, but basically it's the uh, same concept as the Laplace transform in discrete time. So it's what allows you to move from a discrete time version of a signal to a discrete frequency version of a signal. And the inverse Z transform is what allows us to bounce back. We even saw uh, approximations to go from uh, uh, directly, the to move directly in the frequency domain from the continuous to the discrete case. We didn't really spend time looking at the inverse relationship, but it, it, it can be done. So just uh, uh, a few things. 
I would like to, as, as for Laplace transformations, uh, th that's the definition of a Z-transform. It's uh, just for completeness. It's important, though, to keep in mind a couple of properties that are analog to the ones that you saw in the continuous time. One is linearity. You all should know what linearity means, but the idea is if you take the transformation of a sum of signals, the, the um, result is the sum of the transforms. And uh, if you multiply the signals by some scalar, some factor that does not depend on time, then it just gets multiplied by the transform. And then this property of time shift, which we kind of introduced the last class through the shift operator, with the forward shift operator. And the idea is that uh, if we have a, um, if we multiply a signal in the discrete frequency, in the z domain by, by a z or a z inverse, what we're doing is we are shifting it in time by one step forward if we multiply by z's or the powers of z, or k step backwards if we multiply by the z at the minus case. So we will, uh, I just mentioned these two properties because we will use them right away to, do, to, to solve an example and that should uh, uh, make it a little bit more clear what we're talking about. So what, is the, what are we trying to do here? So we're given a continuous time controller that satisfies all the performances we were looking for. We want to get to a equation or something practical, useful that we can actually code in a computer and let it do and it will implement what, we're, what, what our design is. So, so let's see what's the, suppose we have a controller that is C of s given by some kp times uh, ts plus 1 over alpha ts plus 1, okay? Where it's, of course, intended that none of these coefficients that define the controller is zero, of course. So there's, we could say, let's just suppose that kp, a, and t are bigger than zero for simplicity, okay? So, and we are told that the uh, bandwidth of the signal is, uh, let's say, 12 radians per second, okay? So the first thing we have to do is understand we want to uh, sample this, we have to convert the signal to discrete time, so we have to sample the signal and we have to choose the sampling frequency. So you recall that omega is equal to two pi f, so this is two pi the bandwidth frequency, this is roughly six, so it means that fb is roughly, let's say, equal to two hertz the bandwidth of the signal. So how do we choose our sampling time? A sampling, uh, no, actually, it makes more sense to choose the sampling rate. Sampling rate, we need to know, we need the, to choose it at least twice as big as the, uh, at least bigger than the Nyquist frequency, that is twice this value, but let's go with the practical um, rule of thumb that we introduced. So it's 10 times the, this value here, so it's 20 hertz. What does this mean? It means that the sampling period, Ts, which is defined as one over, so yes, these are hertz, right? Hertz are one over a second. So to get the sampling period, you have to invert this. It's gonna be 0 0.05 seconds, okay? Now, Now that we know what is the sampling period that we can use, we want to transform this is C of s into a C of z. Okay? And we know that C of z can be approximated by evaluating C of s, where s is equal to some function, some, some of the approximations we, uh, we, we went with, we described before. Let's choose the most complicated one, the Tustin approximation, complicated in the sense that it has more uh, terms into it. So if you check back a slide or two, you will see that this uh, is uh, z minus 1 plus z plus 1. Please correct me if I am wrong. Okay, so what does this mean? So this means we have to evaluate c of s, where s is equal to this stuff. So it's a little bit um, boring, but let's do it. So c of z 
is equal to what? It's equal to kp times. So t stays at t. Every time I read s, I have to plug in this big mess here. So it's 2t over ts times s, which becomes z minus 1 over z plus 1. You can't read this up there, right? You can? No? So c of z is equal to kp 2t over ts z minus times z minus 1 over z plus 1 plus 1, right? That was the numerator. And then we've got 2 alpha t over ts z minus 1 over z plus 1 plus 1 at the denominator. So let's put this in a nicer form. What do we do? We just do the um, minimum common um, how do you call it? Multiple here. So it's 2t over ts times z minus 1 plus z plus 1. All of this divided by z plus 1, which we will not write because the same thing will happen at the denominator and they just cancel out. So this is 2 alpha t over ts times z minus 1 plus z plus 1. Okay? So once we get to this form, how is it useful to us? Well, we must remember a second that we are dealing with a controller here. And also, if you go back and look at the big uh, block diagrams that we did, we just notice that the controller is that block that gets as an input the, uh, the error and produces as an output u of k, which is the input to the plant, okay? So this uh, c of z is a transfer function. Transfer functions are ratios between the output and the input in the frequency domain in the same way as you defined the Laplace transformation. So this is equal to the input goes down at c of k, and the output is u. Actually, it's not of k, but it's of z, because this, holds in, this, this relationship holds in the frequency, in the discrete frequency domain. So once we nailed down these two passages, the rest is relatively straightforward because what we want to achieve now, our final objective, is to find a rule of this, of this sort, u of k equals something, okay, so that we can actually code it. So how do we, do we get it from here? First, we separate the terms. So from up there, I'll continue writing down here. What we get is uh, u of z that multiplies the denominator. So it's 2 alpha t over ts z minus 1 plus z plus 1. This is equal to e of z times kp 2t over ts z minus 1 plus z plus 1. Correct? Mistakes? Good. Okay, so let's go to the third, the third here of the blackboard. Where are we going with this mess? Now we have to remember that property we just discussed in the previous slide. That is the shifting property in the Laplace, in the z domain. What is the shifting prop uh, property? If we multiply z by something, what we're saying is we're taking that thing one step ahead in the discrete time domain. So let's just write it out. So what am I going to do now is I want to uh, factor out all the terms that are just u of z, e of z, and the ones that have u of z multiplied by something. So this becomes z, u of z, times what? u of z, this term here has z, this term here has z. So it's going to be 1 plus 2 alpha t over ts plus u of z times what? Times uh, 1 minus 2 alpha t over ts. Okay? And this is equal to what? 
Similar thing on the other side. Z of Z, Z times E of Z, times what? Times 1 from this term here, plus KP 2T over TS, plus E of Z, whatever is left, which is 1 minus KP 2T over TS. Okay? So, what... Where is the magic? The magic happens here, because now we know that the Z, we, we saw before that the Z transport, the transform of F of some signal at K plus 1 was equal to Z F of Z. So if we take the inverse transformation, inverse the Z transform from left and right of this equality, what we get is u of k plus 1, which is the inverse part of this, times this number here, let's just call it a big A, let's call this a big B, let's call this a big C, let's call this a big D, so that we can write A times u k plus 1 plus B times u k is equal to C times E K plus 1 plus D times E K. Okay? Now we just uh, step all of this equation, which is a recursive equation, defined at every time instant, one step back. So we say K basically is equal to K minus 1. And uh, we write everything now as a function of U K. U K is equal to what? Okay, we stepped it back once, so it's equal to minus b over a u k minus 1 plus c over a e k plus d over a e k minus 1. Okay, and this is the final relationship we were looking for. Sorry? You want up? You have any questions? Comments? Yes. Could you throw him the hoop, please? Yeah. Um, Based on the way you have written the transfer function in the beginning, it seems to me that KP should be on all the terms on the right-hand side in the end. Say it again. Uh, based on the way you have written the transfer function in the beginning, C of S, KP looks as it should be multiplied with the whole um, uh, overside term of the fraction. But in the end, you have yes, to put it on yes, yes, yes. the terms. Yes, you're right. I forgot a KP here. Basically, right? KP times Z plus 1. The good point, so probably the slides are wrong as well, but it's, uh, it doesn't. So the point of this exercise is seeing how to get to a recursive representation of the UK. These coefficients are numbers. So can I take it down? Anyways, the break is started, so you can feel free to go in a break, and we'll continue later. <laughs> Okay, so we just saw how to derive explicitly an expression of the input in discrete time so that we can actually implement it in a computer. What is this? So this is actually how you would implement it in a pseudocode. Okay, so what is important about uh, to consider when we actually write down uh, a piece of code that implements, that realizes, executes a controller? So there are some variables, some stuff that needs to be computed only once. There's other parts that need to happen at every time step, okay? It's important to distinguish in the code what happens only once from what happens at every time step, because uh, 
it's just wasted time and that increases the delays of the process if you recalculate at every time step what needs to be calculated only once. It's just plain uh, useless. So you will see that the code is divided into big, two big chunks. The first one is the initialization, where you define all the parameters that are useful for your specific thing. So the first thing is you define the sampling period, which is what we derived before, and then you define all the different uh, uh, numbers, okay? Like we use parameters in the example, but they could just have some random numbers. You write down all the different expressions, and those are things that are decided before time. They're not gonna change uh, as we go through the, uh, as we progress in time. And then we make a second part that is a loop, a loop that is executed at every time step. And what it does is it uh, first reads the samples, the new values, that's the ADC part. Then it computes the controller. Then as soon as you have a controller value computed, it makes a sense to send it out from the uh, controller to the actual system. So you write it to the output. And then you just shift the registry, which is the fact that we saw that the, the control law, and even in this simple example, was a function of uh, the error and the input at the last step uh, plus something at this step. So as soon as these values are sent out and we're about to start a new cycle, a new loop, well, what was at the present now, what was the present value in this iteration of the loop becomes the last value in the next iteration of the loop. So this is what we mean by registry shift. Okay, so now let's change page. Breathe, we went through an excursion in uh, single input, single output systems for discrete time versions, okay? We did this because it was important for control engineers to understand that there is a difference between continuous time and discrete time, and it gives you the tools to actually go and implement something on a real platform. If you're going to play around with the ducky bots, you'll know that you'll notice that everything follows these kind of principles. Everything is written on a, on a piece of code, so you will, you can't avoid the discrete time if you if you if you work with real systems. Now, let's forget about for discrete time for a second. Uh, we will uh, conveniently jump throughout the course between continuous and discrete time, depending on what makes it easier for me to explain the concepts we want to explain. Sometimes it's easier to make proofs in, dis in uh, discrete time rather than continuous and vice versa. But now we have to, we will, we will make a step forward in terms of what are the kinds of systems we can apply all our control thoughts on. Up to now, we did only single input, single output. What does it mean? Well, the word says it. Now you have one input, one output. Now we're going to start studying multi-input, multi-output systems. This class in particular is going to be about, let's say, the, the, an introduction, the fundamentals of multi-input, multi-output systems. How do they look? What are their fundamental properties? Poles and zeros, transfer functions, this kind of stuff. In the next classes, we will uh, ramp it up and uh, start looking basically at the story we said at the very beginning. So how to uh, study stability, performances, and robustness, and all of this. At the, in the next three or four classes, we are going to be looking at the analysis part. So how are tools that given a controller, we can check if things are right, if it's stable, if it has good performances, if it's robust. And uh, after the break, in the uh, last part of the course, we'll actually move on to uh, the methods to, discretize, to, to synthesize controllers. So how, how, how do we actually write down and, and design controllers for multi-input, multi-output systems? We'll do all of that uh, in the last three or four classes. So why are multi-input, multi-output systems important? Because basically all real systems are multi-input, multi-output. Uh, think about a car. Uh, inputs, you steer, you press the accelerator. Uh, think and that's two inputs. Think about um, the attitude control of a satellite. Well, you have different torques in the three dimensions which are going to generate different, um, different rotations. The outputs are the poses in the, around the three different axes. The inputs are the three different torques you send in. Uh, even a ducky bot uh, is a multi-input, multi-output system. It has uh, two inputs, which are the two voltages that go to the wheels, and it has uh, um, several outputs, the pose, that is, the position and the orientation and time. You can look at classical examples like the um, let's see, chemical processes, when you have or distillation processes, things like this, where you have a bunch of valves that you have to open and close, and the inputs are the position of the, these valves, and the outputs are maybe the concentrations of your chemical reactions in some tanks. Or you can look at a heat exchanger. They're, they're basically, if you look at it, most systems 
are multi-input, multi-output. So we have to develop some tools to formalize these systems. So jumping a little bit directly to the end, what are the biggest difference between MIMO systems and CISO systems? Of course, we're not going to restart control systems from scratch, right? Like everything we learned up to now is useful for MIMO systems. But there are some commonalities and some differences. Arguably, the biggest difference is that MIMO systems don't have transfer functions, okay? They have matrices of transfer functions. This has repercussions, and we will look at them today. Another big difference between MIMO and CISO systems is that MIMO have a concept of directionality for everything. Why? Intuitively. In CISO systems, you have a transfer function, which is a scalar, right? It's a complex when you have, every time we write C of S, whatever, that's a number, right? If you plug in an S, you get a number. It's a scale, one by one. In MIMO systems, you have a matrix as a transfer function. If you plug in an S, you get a matrix. The inputs and the outputs are no longer single. They're no longer one number. They're vectors. So when you have vectors and matrices involved, there are concept of directions. And this is going to permeate basically every single concept we look at for MIMO systems. Um, once we take into account these two big differences, most of the concepts are the same. We can mostly generalize things from single input, single output system theory, apart from some little differences, again, that are defined as before. I think the biggest, the funnest one is how many times you've been said, be careful about poles and zeros cancellations because a mess can happen if you, if, if, if you do it wrong, right? It turns out in MIMO systems that uh, you can have poles and zeros at the same frequency and they don't cancel out, okay? Why? Because they're just in, in different directions. So there's the concept of directionality even for poles and zeros. But we'll, we'll look at all of this in, the, in this and the next classes. So let's start from a nice comparison of what, it, what, like, what does it mean to have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. On the left, you see what you already know very much about, single input, single output systems, okay? So you start from, we're looking at uh, the state space representations, and uh, regardless of single input, single output, the state of the system is always the same. It's, a, it's an n by one vector, and then where n is the order of the system, okay? And we know this. The big difference is that now the inputs are not scalars, but they're vectors of, we'll say, m components. And the outputs are not scalars, but they're vectors of, we'll say, L components. So if we go now through the, uh, through the dimensions, uh, we calculate the dimension of all of the matrices, we will notice that there's one big difference, which is that uh, the C matrix and the B matrix and the D matrix are no longer, uh, have different dimensions that account for the dimension of the inputs and the outputs. So C becomes an L by N, B becomes an M by M, and so on. I think it might be useful to just do a very short, uh, um, like, I'll, I'll keep it, no, I have, okay, let's do it well. So very briefly, just to, to make sure, maybe this is obvious stuff for you, but I think it's a very useful tool to have. How do we figure out dimensions of stuff? So. Say that u is, uh, we said, an m by 1 vector, okay? So this is m by 1. y is a l by 1, and the x is always an n by 1, okay? So what, I want, what do I want to show you? How to make sense of the dimensions of things, because the more we will progress in MIMO systems, the more we have to be careful about how we multiply stuff, because it's all about the dimensions. So let's say we are looking at x dot of t is equal to a x plus b u. So what do we know? We know that x is an m by 1 vector. So x dot is an m by 1 vector. x is an m by 1 vector. And that's pretty much it. What else do we know? We know that u is an m by 1. And we know that u is an m by 1. x is an n by 1. y is an l by 1. OK? So how do we figure out the dimensions of the intermediate Oh. of the intermediate matrices. Well, 
first, think of the, of the dimensions as if they were physical units when you write equations in physics, okay? You can't, have, you can't equate apples and pears. What is on the left of the equal has to be the same dimension of what is on the right of the equal. So if this is an m by 1, all of this has to be an m by 1. And the same goes for the other equation. So, and then we have to remember another rule. When you have a product of two matrices, say this is uh, m by n and this is n by p, it's a matrix multiplications is row times columns. So it's very important that these center numbers are the same. And then the output is the first and the last. It's an m by p. This is fundamental to remember. It makes life very easy. So this is an m by 1. What does it mean? That since all this left part has to be an m by 1, it means that a has to be an n by something. What is the something? Well, the two center values have to agree. So it's m by n. b has to be an n by something. What is the other something? Well, the center values have to agree. So it has to be an m by m. OK, and so the same argument for everything else. y is an l by 1. So everything on the right-hand side has to be l by 1. So this has to be an L by what? By N. This has to be a what? L by what? M. Okay? That's how you find out the dimensions of matrices. So once we define the, the um, state space representation, we notice that we have now these uh, uh, a, B, C's, and D's that have different dimensions from before. How does that have repercussions on transfer functions? Well, if you do the Laplace transformation of the time domain things and just follow the passages, the top equation, which you already know because you derived it for single input, single output systems, is uh, the same for MIMO systems. It's just that it means something slightly different. If you now take into account the new dimension of the matrices, and uh, let's look only at the second part, the C times SI minus A inverse B, which is, let's say, the most famous one. So we're assuming that the initial conditions are 0 and D is equal to 0. Then you'll see that CISO systems have transfer functions. That is, the transfer function is equal to something that is a number. OK, it's a scalar. For MIMO systems instead, you just do the multiplications. What you get is a matrix where each entry is the transfer function between the corresponding input and output. So, and each one of these P's has, can have a form like this. Any questions, comments, doubts? So now that we have these transfer function matrices that relate ith inputs to the jth outputs, Depending only by the shape, the structure of the transfer function, we can already say something about the system. We call interactive systems those are systems where an input can, have, can affect multiple outputs in general. So, for example, a, a, a transfer function that has uh, uh, every entry has some value. We call non-interactive systems the ones in which every input controls directly one output or has effect on one single output. Intuitively speaking, it's nice to have a multi-input, multi-output system where things don't interact. Because if I change one input, I see directly the change on one, on the, on one output and nothing else. There are control strategies that we're going to look at that aim at creating this, at creating a non-interactive system such that each channel then can then be controlled through a... Uh, uh, controllers defined by single input, single output theory, because basically what you're doing is you're just making a MIMO system a cascade of CISO systems. Something else we can say just by looking at the shape, uh, the size of P of S, so it's a matrix, right? Uh, a matrix uh, doesn't have to be square, it can be rectangular. It depends on the number of inputs and the number of outputs. There's no other constraint that determines the size of the transfer function in this case. So typically speaking, uh, when we have uh, more outputs than inputs, what does it mean? It means that uh, there are some output directions, and this is a concept that we'll uh, mention a lot in this class, but we'll investigate the in detail only at next class because we need some tools that we don't have the time to, uh, to introduce today, um, nominally the singular value decomposition. But the concept is if you have more outputs than inputs is that some output directions cannot be affected, cannot be modified by the inputs. Well, in the opposite case, if you have more inputs than outputs, 
It means there are some input directions that have no effect on the outputs. So you're wasting, so to speak, some, some input potential. And we, we say that a system is functionally controllable when the rank of the transfer matrix is the same as the number of outputs you actually care to control. This is, is, is just to, to lay an intuition. It's no need to get into details. So what about poles and zeros? Well, the, what's the idea of a pole? A pole was something that uh, we could have imagined as a, a frequency generator point, so to speak, in the sense if we sent um, a sinusoid as an input to the system at that specific frequency, what happened is that the system blew up, right? Because we had a zero at the denominator of the transfer function. So the idea of a pole is conserved in uh, multi-input, multi-output systems in the sense that a pole is uh, a value, a frequency value, that if we send in an input in a certain direction, because now inputs are no longer scalars, they're vectors, right? So depending on the uh, different values of the entries of the vector, you can orient the vector in whatever space it's defined in. And, uh, but the idea is that the output if we send an input in a specific direction at the pole frequency, it blows up the output, okay? So you'll get an infinite response, as in single input, single output theory, according to some output direction. And we'll look at that later. So um, there are different ways to, to actually finding the poles of a system. And uh, um, it's uh, typically, you, if we look at a transfer function matrix, a pole of a MIMO system is a pole of some of the entrant of the entry uh, variable, entry entry elements of the system, of the transfer function. In another way, we can just look at the polynomial, a uh, characteristic polynomial of the A matrix, if we are thinking about the transfer function, because at the end of the day, the denominator of a transfer function is given by the inverse part, S i minus A inverse. When you do that operation, the denominator is the determinant of S i minus A, and that's the only thing that contributes to the denominator. So the poles are actually the zeros of the denominator of the transfer function. Now, how to determine the multiplicities of poles, which is something, so a pole can be a pole a number of times, not necessarily only once, right? It could be uh, any number of times. The poles, the multiplicities of poles and zeros are non-trivial. Um, I don't think it's useful to put up here a very long definition. We will add some, I, I noted down some additional references. You can go look at it and you'll get a nice definition of the multiplicities. The same applies for zeros. The concept of zeros instead of is, is that, again, as in CISO systems, as a, a cancellation frequency. So if we send in a signal at a certain input and at a frequency in a certain direction at a frequency that corresponds to a zero, the output is zero, as suggested by the name, in a certain direction of the output. Again, there's always this concept of directionality that comes out from MIMO systems. And how do we find a, a, a zero, actually, from given a transfer function matrix? One easy way of, of thinking about it is just when the, when the matrix loses rank. So if there are some values of S that uh, reduce the rank of the transfer function matrix, then it means that we are losing some directions, so to speak, because the rank is reduced. So that corresponds to zeros, actually to a particular family of zeros, which are called the transmission zeros. Or a more general definition is uh, that of um, a zero of a transfer function, is when you send an input and the output, uh, the input that has to be finite and different from zero, and the output is zero. So that can be represented through the limit relationship. And uh, again, there are directions associated with it, and the multiplicities are non trivial. So let's look at an example because this is much easier seen than said. What is the point of this exercise? The point of this exercise is see how uh, uh, weird things can happen with poles and zeros in the context of multi-input, multi-output systems with respect to what we know for single input, single output systems. So I think it's, so we defined the poles to be uh, values that make the denominator zero at least in one of the entries of the system. So we can easily see here that S equals three is, a, let's call it a pole, P. 
but it's not obvious at all that this system has a zero as well. If you look at it and you think about, as we would think for a single input, single output system, ah, let's look at all the independent transfer, transfer functions. Remember that this is a relationship between inputs and outputs, right? So say you've got uh, a, uh, P11 of S, a P12 of S, P21 of S, and P22 of S. You're multiplying this by U1, U2. And you get as a result Y1 and Y2. So you can think of each entry of the transfer function as a specific channel between the ith input and the jth output. So why? Because y1 is equal to p11 times this. So this is the transfer function that relates the effect of the first input on the first output, and so on with all the other terms. So here there is no evident zeros, but uh, if we look at, for example, but we know that a zero is something that if we send an input and we calculate the output, the output is zero at all times. So, for example, if we send, uh, uh, if we look at this, this transfer function, and we send in an input that is constructed so that we can, uh, so that it is different from zero at the pole at the zero, which in this case is, let's write it as z for now, then we'll figure it out. The output is always zero. The output of this is, as we said here, row times columns, so it would be minus one plus one, and the denominator is s minus three. This is the output y of s when we multiply P of s times u of s. Now, if we do the limit for s that goes to some value, we see that this is always a zero, and this, if s is equal to three, is a zero as well. So it turns out that three is a zero as well of this system in the direction defined by this. So this is just a simple example to show that, look, we have non-obvious zeros. It's not clear from, we have no numerator that goes to zero directly, but still there is a direction that if you send any input in that direction at that frequency, you don't get an output. So it's the definition of zero. And we've got a pole as well. And they're at the same frequency. Yes? The output has to be zero in all directions. So what's the, 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 the takeaway of this exercise? The takeaway of this exercise is that, uh, yes? One question. How do we get the U of S? There are different ways. So here is by inspection. Um, there are the most structured way of doing it is through a singular value decomposition. It's something we will talk about next uh, lesson. And that's the best way of doing it. There are other techniques to compute poles and zeros of MIMO systems that are related to the computation of minors inside the matrices, and you'll see those during exercise sessions. So what is the key point of this exercise? The key point of this exercise is that uh, there are directions associated with poles and zeros, and you can have poles and zeros at the same frequency without cancellations if the directions are different. So now that we know what a transfer function is, and we know how to find the poles and zeros. So what is the tricky part here? The tricky part is that matrix multiplication is non-commutative, OK? So if you take two, generally speaking, if you take two matrices and you multiply them and they're in different orders, you don't get the same result. So you have to be careful when you evaluate the interconnection of systems, because uh, up to now, they were all scalars. So we could just flip over the controller and, uh, and the plants, and it didn't really matter. Now it matters a lot, it changes everything. So if you have a series of two systems, what you do is uh, you get a transfer function that is the series of the transfer functions, but in a specific order. 
And uh, the way to determine it is by doing the calculations by hand. But I, I mean, as a, as a general rule, you always start from the end and you step backwards. You step backwards until you get to the input of the, of, of the signal. And if you find the loops at some point as you're stepping back, you substitute the transfer function with that of a feedback loop. So how do the equations for the feedback loop work? So please be careful here that there are two cases written in one. One is the positive feedback and the other is the negative feedback and the signs are inverted. So when you have a positive feedback, you get uh, a minus here and vice versa. These uh, equations, uh, if it's important, so since matrices are not commutative, it's the, there are different, basically, if we evaluate the transfer functions at the input or at the output. And uh, it's, uh, it's clear here, if you look at the transfer function between the output of the signal and the U of T there, in which case is what acts as a reference, you will see that the center part, what we in single input, single output systems call the, the open loop transfer function, the L, is, 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 can be two different things. It can either be G1, G2, so starting from the last one going backwards if we look at the output, or be the inverse for G2, G1 if we look at the input. So this gives us a, a, a feeling that uh, depending where we evaluate transfer functions, we'll get different cases. And the reason for that is because of the order of, of multiplication in matrices that is important. So as we have seen sensitivity functions for single input, single output cases, that turned out to be important because they allowed us to um, quantify the, the, say the gains for different relationships between uh, disturbances, noises, and, and, uh, and the reference signals with the actual variables of the system that were relevant to us, the states, the output, the error. We can do the same thing for MIMO systems. Um, I will not go through the actual algebra here because it's not difficult and I think it's a good exercise for you. So I would invite you to derive these transfer functions, these sensitivity functions, and, uh, and we'll have to make a distinction between the transfer functions, that we, the sensitivity functions that we evaluate at the output of the system which means start by writing y of t is equal to, and y of s in this case, if you do it in the frequency domain, and start stepping back until you close the loop. And you will get equations that are very similar to the ones that we've seen before <clears throat> for CISO systems. We have a loop transfer function. That is the multiplication of the, all the blocks that are on the open loop on the direct branch, starting from the last one. A sensitivity function and a complementary sensitivity function. The sensitivity function uh, describes the, 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 the mapping between the noise and the output, while the complementary sensitivity function maps the uh, relationship between the reference signals and the output. So when uh, we refer to sensitivity functions that are evaluated at the output, they are either explicitly marked with an O, or since typically those are the default ones that people refer to, if no PEDIX is mentioned, then the, uh, we're referring to the output sensitivity matrix. The same can be done for input sensitivity functions, where what we're doing now is we are evaluating the effect of different uh, inputs to the systems, that is, the disturbances, the noise, or the reference, with respect to U or B, which are the inputs to the plant. Now, the order in which the different blocks of the system are uh, affecting the transfer functions is different. So you've got the input sensitivity functions, which are fundamentally equal to the output ones, but the loop transfer function is inverted. It's not G2, G1, or PC in this case, but CP. But that changes a lot because if you remember, C and P, for example, we looked at it explicitly before, it can have arbitrary dimensions. It can be rectangular of dimensions the, the determined by the, the, the size of the input and the size of the output. So if you multiply... We're doing this. Just. If you multiply... Let's say you've got uh, P that is an... Uh, L by M, 
and C that is an M by L. If we do P times the C, the result is going to be an L by L. If instead we look at C times P, and they have always the same dimensions as before, the result is an M by M. So there is a great difference, not only in the numbers, but even on the sizes, in changing the order of multiplications. One thing that is worth noticing, though, is that although the transfer functions and the controllers will have rectangular dimensions, depending on what L and M are, these are the uh, loop transfer functions. This is the output case. This is the input case. You will notice that however the dimensions of inputs and outputs are, the loop transfer functions are always square, which is, can turn out to be useful. OK, so what is important to look at here? First, uh, uh, an, 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 a nice property. It's called the push-through rule. It helps a lot in doing computations for finding out the different transfer functions. Demonstrating that is, again, an exercise we will keep for the exercise sessions. It's two passages. We still observe that the constraints on the sensitivity and complementary sensitivity function being complementary, that is, their sum being not equal to one, but equal to an identity in this case, because we're talking about matrices and not numbers anymore, holds true for both input and output sensitivity matrices. So you can write S plus T at a specific frequency equals to an identity for the input sensitivity functions and for the output sensitivity functions, and that holds true in both cases. And, uh, and so what is the next step now that we have sensitivity functions? If we want to follow what we did before, well, sensitivity functions describe the relationship between, for example, um, a disturbance and, uh, and, and an input to the system, or a noise and the and, uh, tracking error. So we care to measure what somehow what is the effect, the, the, the size of, this, uh, of these uh, transfer functions, because when we define the performances through the sensitivity functions in the CISO case, we arrived at that nice loop shaping diagram where we said, ah, the loop transfer function has to be big at low frequency and small at high frequencies because uh, uh, whatever, whatever. Now, what does it mean, big and small, in this case? So there is, again, this concept of directionality which permeates MIMO systems. And I think it would be useful to do this very simple and quick uh, example that really shows what What we mean. Mm, this space here should be enough. So let's say that we have a very simple system, which is y of t is equal to, it's a direct uh, relationship with some matrix G and U of t. And let's say that G is a uh, matrix like this. This is a 1. It's 10, all zeros and a 10, OK? So if we send in an input that is, for example, 1, 0, so it's an input in a certain direction of, uh, let's say, it has magnitude 1, so let's say that this is the input space where the first component will call it u1, the second component we call it u2. This is an input in this direction, OK? If we look at the output, in this case, is equal to g times u. And sorry, this has to be transposed. So it's uh, basically 0, 10, 0, 0, 1, 0. And this turns out to be all zeros. So in this case, we're sending in an input in a certain direction. We don't get any output. Now, we send in a different input that has the same magnitude, but just in a different direction. So it's not like we're forcing the system more or we're doing anything. We're pushing on it. Uh, it's 
with more effort. It's just changing the direction of the input. For example, let u now be 0, 1. Now the output is equal to 0, 1, so it's 10, 0. So this is just a simple example to show that if we just tweak the direction of inputs, we can get wildly different output results. And uh, although we still have not introduced the right tools, it is pretty clear that in some sense, 10, 0, this y vector is much bigger than 0, 0, even if this is not a, a formal definition yet. But what that this exercise tells us is that uh, it is important to keep track of these directions, and it's important to uh, have tools to measure what is the effect of the gains in different directions. And this is what we're going to do in the next classes. So what did we do today? We looked at MIMO systems um, and its fundamentals, transfer functions, poles and zeros, and the interconnections of transfer functions. And we noticed that the biggest uh, issue is this concept of directionality. In the next classes, we will develop tools to measure these, uh, these, these, these sizes of transfer functions. In, uh, and, and these tools are norms, and we'll look at signal norms and system norms, and what do they mean. And then we will uh, formalize this concept of directionality and, and, and develop tools to actually quantify it. And we'll look at eigenvalues, we'll look at singular value decompositions, and something called the relative gain array. Once we have these tools, we can finally start looking at the main objectives of controls, which is stability, performance, and uh, robustness for MIMO systems. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. One thing, uh, we have flyers for the Linux sessions here at the front desk, so please come down and pick one before you go away so you can know when the appointments are.